Good morning. Good morning. Welcome once again here with us at the Second Baptist Worship Center. We indeed are grateful for your presence. Man, it seems like it's been a long time since we've had the opportunity to be together. But this morning, I am so happy to be in your presence. And I pray that you are happy to once again be here and share in the Bible study experience. Um, this morning, as always, we want you to know that we have been praying for you without ceasing. We've been asking God uh, to give you strength. We recognize that we are living in extremely challenging times. We also recognize that there are some of you that have indeed been ill, and we've been praying and lifting you up before the Lord, asking God to strengthen and to encourage you. We thank you for praying for us and for blessing the Second Baptist Worship Center as well as this leadership. And we uh, are trusting God to continue to bless us in so many ways. We trust that you've had a safe summer thus far. But we pray that you've also had a time that you were allowed to enjoy with your family because we took, uh, obviously, uh, the month of July and August off, and now we're back. We're back this morning. We're going to begin by studying in the Old Testament in the book of Joshua. And so we hope that you will recognize that God is blessing his people even here in the Old Testament. But this morning, before I begin, as always, we begin with prayer. We also will share with you some pertinent information that we hope will be helpful both for our viewers as well as for our community. Uh, join me in prayer, if you would, right now. Father, we come into your presence. We are so grateful uh, that you have watched over us, that you have kept us, that you have blessed our lives. And God, we, we just want to take a moment to say thank you, and we just want to worship you uh, for your grace and for your goodness. We thank you for being so loving and so kind as to keep us and to bless our lives in so many ways. And as a result of you having blessed us, God, uh, we equally, hopefully, have been a blessing to others. And so even now, as we come together, we ask that your Holy Spirit will continue to be our teacher, that you will open up to us those truths that you would have us to know, and that you will just, God, enlighten us open up our minds so that we might see your truth, hear your word, and understand what you're saying to us both corporately and individually. So for the membership of the Second Baptist Church, Father, we're asking your richest blessings upon your people. And we're not so selfish just to pray for the membership here, but we're asking you to meet the needs of our viewers, that you will indeed, God, allow your spirit or just to open up their mind, that you might bless them mightily, that you will give them that truth uh, that passes uh, absolutely all understanding, and that you'll open it up to them so that somehow, God, each individual will hear your voice. Speak to us now. Heal as only you're capable of healing. Deliver only as you're able to deliver, and help us, God, to seek your face this day. Speak to us now. Breathe upon your word so that life may be found in your word for our lives. Bless us spiritually, physically, mentally, and financially. All these things, God, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And again, we thank you so much for praying with us and praying for us. And we pray this morning that God has touched your heart, touched your spirit this morning so that there's no doubt that you are in his presence. His spirit engulfs you this morning. His spirit wants you to know that there is a lesson in the literature, in the biblical text, that's there specifically for you. So if, in fact, you're watching and you feel like there is some information in this book, in the book of Joshua, you might want to uh, text someone, call someone, uh, at least share with them so that they somehow join us this morning as we study from this great Old Testament book of the Bible. Imagine just for a moment that according to the historical facts behind this particular book, 
the great lawgiver, better known as Moses, has stepped off the scene. He is no longer with the Israelites, but his reputation and his legend is still there with the Jews. The Israelites understand that he was a great individual, an individual who was sharing uh, what God had given to him to the people of God. He went so far as to making sure uh, that God's people and the covenant that was with Abraham was a covenant that was to be shared with everyone who came out of the lineage of Abraham. Imagine just for a moment, Moses has gone off the scene, a great, strong, powerful leader, and now thrust into the hands of, of an individual who indeed is now given the task of leading the Israelites right into the land of promise. Remember, God has promised this uh, with the Israelites through Abraham, and God is faithful to his promise. Moses is not allowed to go in, and yet we discover that this young individual, uh, that Moses has groomed, has positioned to take his spot, will now be the one that will lead the Israelites into of the promised land. But can you imagine the Israelites haven't always been that faithful, just like many of us. Uh, they've acquiesced uh, to the various tribes, to individuals who are uh, Gentiles, individuals who truly don't understand the relationship that Israel has with Yahweh. And as a result, uh, these individuals have begun to pick up on some of the ideologies, some of the thinking of the non-believers, and it has caused them to begin to live like some of the non-believers. It is Joshua's task to pick up the mantle since Moses has given it to him and lead the individuals into a land of hope, a land of promise. And so there are some prominent persons in the biblical text that will stand out for us as we read. And our hope is that when we look at those prominent individuals, we will discover ourselves and understand our assignment in light of what God has done through Moses, through Joshua, and through Israel. So today, hopefully, we'll take a look at chapters 1 and 2, and hopefully each week, uh, God willing and the time allows, we'll take a look at two chapters per week. So this week, obviously, we're going to take a look at chapters 1 and 2. Next week, we'll take a look at chapters two, excuse me, 3 and 4. So again, that's 1 and 2 today, 3 and 4 next week. We want to hear what Joshua has to say. Remember, the word Joshua literally means that Jehovah saves. So if this is true, the whole theme and thrust behind this book is to suggest that even though the great lawgiver Moses has gone off the scene, God has provided for the people of God a way of salvation through uh, Joshua. Joshua is a name in the Old Testament that is better rendered in the New Testament as Jesus. Imagine, just imagine for a moment that there are some similarities and some likenesses that are found in Joshua in the Old Testament and Jesus in the New. Let's take a look at chapter 1. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version, so if you will bear with me. Please remember, if there are any questions, any thoughts uh, that that you may have over the biblical text as we read, make sure that you shoot that to me. Let me know uh, in email, in a text, whichever format you decide so that we can get back with you next week and deal with those questions that you may have for the text. Joshua, chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, so already we've discovered right away that the assignment has been given to Joshua to pick up the mantle and to take on the leadership position that Moses has recently vacated. Moses, according to the biblical text, is dead. We do know uh, that this book is named Joshua. Our belief is that Joshua is probably the primary writer but he has an assistance that we believe may have concluded the writings that Joshua started. Otherwise, Joshua couldn't tell about his own demise, his own death. Therefore, 
there must have been another writer assisting Joshua to complete the story. Verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm given to them, to the people of Israel. Remember, God is faithful. He will always keep his word. He's made a promise uh, to the people of God that he would indeed take them into the promised land. He would bless them immensely because of his relationship, because of the covenant agreement that he has with Abraham. God is committed and consistent consistent and will do just what he says he will do. So the people are moving towards the promised land. They are about to cross the Jordan. They are at the end of the 40 years that they spent in the wilderness and now are being led out of it by Joshua. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I've given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Now imagine for a moment God has reminded them that God is going to bless them immensely. God is going to bless them because they have been obedient, because of his relationship and his agreement, both with Moses, with Abraham, and with the people of God. The moment that we can discover that when we are faithful, to the agreement that we've made with God, that God is faithful with his agreement to bless us, then we'll discover that God has great things in store for us. So why not just be faithful to God and do what God requires? Verse 5 says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. There'll be no one that can literally stand up against you when, in fact, you're faithful to God and committed to doing what God has asked you to do and you've kept your word. So often in our own personal lives, we will give God our word. God will be faithful to keep his word. The problem is, is that we have a tendency to fall back on our agreement. But God says, if you keep your side of the bargain, I'll keep my side of the bargain, and you'll be blessed. The word says, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Those are good encouraging words going to Joshua, because as you can imagine, having been with Moses, uh, going through this Egyptian bondage, having indeed spent his whole life in Egyptian bondage, and then being fashioned and conditioned and given the mindset to lead the people at a strategic period had to be extremely frightening to Joshua. So Joshua needs words of encouragement, like we do sometimes. So God says to Joshua, I'm going to be with you, Joshua, the same way that I was with Moses. Can you imagine that? Our foreparents that were blessed by God to have what they had, to be able to complete what they completed with what little they did have. God is saying to us, just as I blessed your mother and your father and your grandparents and your foreparents, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to bless you. I can't speak for you this morning, but that's a blessing for my soul to know that if my parents can make it on what little they had, if they could be sustained, then surely God is going to be faithful to sustain me. He says, I will not leave you or forsake you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their father to give to them. Again, not only is God encouraging Joshua, but now God is turning his attention towards the people of God and encouraging them, reminding them that just as he was with their foreparents, he will also be with them. Just as God has blessed me, God has promised that he's going to bless my children and those who will follow, provided we are in agreement with the covenant. Verse 7 says, Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. And again, it's all about faithfulness. It's all about doing what God has commanded you to do. So if you are faithful to the law of God that Moses has presented, presented to the people, if in fact you're faithful like Joshua and God has put you in a very strategic position, then God is wanting to bless you. So if in fact you're in a leadership position in a church or whatever uh, institution you are part of, please know that God is going to bless you provided you're consistent and committed in what God has called you to. That's, God, that's all God has ever wanted of us 
was to be faithful and committed. The next verse says, Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. So as long as we're consistent, faithful, and directive in what it is God has assigned to us, God will bless us so that whatever we put our hands to, we will be blessed. Now, now that means that you literally have to be faithful to God. So whatever you do, know that your success is contingent upon your obedience. I say that again. Your success is contingent upon you being obedient to the will and the way of God. So often, the reason why we're not so blessed is because we've not been so faithful and committed to God. Verse 8, eight says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. So, the laws that Moses has given to the people, the Torah, the teachings of God, that are relevant for a successful life of the people of God, must be adhered to. If you're going to follow God, follow his book, follow his writings. We have, in our religious canon, 66 books in our Bible. In this book, this canon of ours, we would be wise to follow the mandates that are found in the book. If the law is suggesting that we should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, then indeed that's exactly what we should do. When we are doing that, then those who come behind us begin to follow in our footsteps to discover that God indeed wants us to be committed to his word and to follow in the laws that are written. The word says, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So you want to be prosperous? You want to be successful? Follow the mandates of God, not the mandates of humankind, not your own uh, ideology, but follow the directions of God. So often we get twisted when we go left because we, des we decide to follow somebody other than God, some ideology other than the theology of God. But let's be faithful and follow the teachings of Yahweh. And verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord, the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And so again, recognizing this great weight that must be upon the back of Joshua, recognizing uh, the people of God going into a land uh, that they've never seen before, going to the unknown has always been frightening. Having to lead such a great number of people has to be extremely frightening. Some young preachers, uh, when they've get, been given the opportunity uh, to lead the people of God, whether it is a church, a synagogue, a temple, a mosque, whatever it may be, when uh, the supreme being, when the God of the universe has given us an assignment to lead the people, sometimes the assignment can appear so overwhelming, looms so large, that sometimes we just don't feel like we can do it. How many times have I talked to individuals who are involved in leadership, and they may be involved with maybe six people in the ministry that they are part of, maybe 10 people, maybe 20 people that they are having to oversee. And individuals come to various meetings with ideologies and thoughts that someone else has shared with them. And so they show up at the meeting and they, the leader becomes disgruntled because they're listening to these people coming at them from many different, uh, very positions. And they're trying to figure out what's God's way which way does God want me going? Well, if we can ever be faithful to God and to follow God's lead rather than humankind's lead, there's a good chance that God is going to make us successful and God's going to make us prosperous. But it's only when we learn how to follow the leadership of God. That means we have to stay in prayer. We must meditate upon his word day and night so that we can hear his voice when he speaks to us so that we know what the mandate of God is for us. Joshua has just been thrust into a position 
of leadership of millions of people. He has leaders under him that are over various tribes within the nation of Israel. And he's having to show them how to successfully move forward. At the Second Baptist Worship Center, if there are some 300, 400 members that are on the roll, then there are 30 different ministries that we have here in the life of the church. We have auxiliary heads over each and every one of those ministries. And those individuals are responsible for making sure that each one of those ministries are moving successfully and are prosperous in light of what God has assigned to them. Now, if in fact you are one of those individuals and you have been negligent in what it is God has called you to, now is the time for you to begin to speak with God, to listen for his voice, to be prepared, to follow his directives so that you can lead those ministries into an area that God is pleased with. If you become negligent, now is the time to make some changes in those areas. If you're sitting at home this morning and you know at one time you were a part of the church and you were faithful and you were doing some things in the life of the church and you just bailed out and you use the excuse of the pandemic for not coming to the church, but you can go everywhere else you want to go. If you indeed have opted uh, just to, to sit back, please hear me. Please hear me. Uh, if in fact you've been assigned a position, you have to know that if you have not been faithful to it and if you've not been active, actively involved in one way or another, whether it's through Facebook, YouTube, whether you have been on Zoom with us, whether or not you have uh, touched bases with the church, you know that you've been negligent in your duties. And if that's the case, you know as well as I do, there's no way that you can possibly be the leader of that particular ministry because you've not been present. That doesn't sit well with most people. Can you imagine Joshua having to deal with people who at one time were faithful, those who were in Egypt now moving towards the promised land? The amazing piece for me is that so often as you move forward and things begin to look good, you got people that will want to step up who at one time were in leadership but bailed out and now they wanted to come back, take those positions that they once held as if they were never missing. Please know that if you bailed out, there are avenues that you have to go through in order to come back in those positions. I only attempt to help us understand that those are some of the dynamics that Joshua had to deal with as they moved towards the promised land. In verse 10, listen very carefully. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people. You hear that? You got to have auxiliary heads in position. And then Joshua gives directives for each one of those. That's why we have leadership meetings in the life of the church, the temple, the mosque, the synagogue. So that everybody knows what's going on in the life of those religious institutions. The word said, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions for for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take the possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Now he's already informed them in three days you must be prepared to go in because your assignment is to go in and possess what it is God has already prepared for you. Now as we continue to uh, wrestle with this, this enemy, this pandemic, you know, the coronavirus, as we continue to deal with the Delta strain, we've got to recognize that these are just enemies of the devil attempting to stop the progress of the people of God and all of humanity. Please know that you must spend much time spending face-to-face -face time with God, praying, asking God to protect you, to strengthen you. Again, if you are viewing us this morning and you've not been vaccinated, I cannot stress it enough. You need to go out and get your vaccination. You want to make sure that you're protected so that you stay well. And when the time comes and there's a booster that's needed, if in, if in fact we're required to get the booster, do what's best for you and your family. So the people of God are moving towards the promised land. 
always, when you're going towards the promise, there are always dilemmas that you'll be facing. Listen carefully as Joshua has given directives to the, to the officers and the people as the, he prepares them for this journey. Because in three days, in three days, the people of God are going to have to move towards the land of promise. Verse 12 says, And the Reubenites, the Gittites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. So Joshua just reminds them of what the great lawgiver Moses has already shared with them. It is no secret. It is not something that they did not know about. Joshua is just helping them to understand that Moses has given you the directives and now we're just following through. Imagine spending 40 years in the wilderness. Moses had led them from Egyptian bondage. They spent 40 years in the wilderness and now Joshua's task is to move them into the promised land. In verse 14, Joshua continues to listen to God and these are the words that are being said. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor among you shall pass over armed before your brothers and shall help them. Before I get to verse 15, you know that these directions are given so that if there is anticipated war, there needs to be warriors that are prepared to do battle. In the event, as you go into a land of promise, there are individuals who are there who are going to attempt to stop your progress. In the life of any religious institution, there will always be individuals who, even when they don't know it, are trying to stop the progress of that particular institution. Again, whether it is a church, whether it is a temple, a synagogue, or a mask, there is always someone who indeed is trying to stop the progress. In verse 15, the word says, Until the Lord gives rest to your brothers, as he has to you, and they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So again, the land that they are possessing is not because they've been sinless, not because they are perfect, but it is because God is keeping his agreement and because God is giving the land over to them. Everything that we possess in this life, every uh, progress that the church makes is a result of God loving us so much that he's willing to bless us in spite of our stubbornness, in spite of our hard-headedness, and God is loving us to move us forward. You know that you are healthy. You know that you have your right mind. You know that you're being fed, you're being clothed, you're being sheltered only because God has loved you so much that he is the one who continues to keep you. Verse, the verse says, Then you shall return to the land of your possessions and shall possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan towards the sunrise. And so God is continuing to bless the people of God in spite of their inconsistency. I got to confess that even in spite of my own inconsistencies, God continues to bless me. And don't look at me so strangely, because you too recognize that there have been some inconsistencies in your personal life. But even beyond your inconsistencies, God continues to bless you. It is not that God is awarding uh, our stubbornness or hard-headedness, but it's because he loves us so much that in spite of our sins, he still blesses us. It's just like uh, parents and children. We, we may not like what they do, what they say, but the bottom line is it, we don't stop loving them. We continue to love them and we continue to bless them. And so I hope this morning that there's some uh, relationship that you may have with your parent, with your child, if there is something that has come between you or a family member, a sibling, whatever you do, make sure that you settle it. Make sure uh, that you get it straightened out because life is so short. Life is too short 
uh, for us to be at odds with each other. Uh, please know that God, if he can love us beyond our faults and our fallacies, then surely we can love one another beyond our faults. In verse 16, the word says, And they answered Joshua, All that you commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Wow. It would be nice if I could just speak to all the church members here at the Second Baptist Worship Center and they would reply, just as these individuals have a reply to Joshua. Where you tell us to go, we'll go. What you tell us to do, we will do. There are awesome people members in the life of, of this religious institution that they have enough faith to believe that if in fact leadership has been leading through a wilderness from an Egyptian bondage. And let me see if I can uh, verbalize this in uh, terminology that we can better understand today. If in our personal lives, when we were captured by our sins, that's our Egyptian bondage, when in fact uh, we had no strength to get ourselves out of the situation and God led somebody our way to help us uh, to get out of that predicament. And then we moved from our bondage to sin into a land that seemed to be a holding pattern, almost like a wilderness. If we spend a prolonged period of time in a wilderness stage, remember 40 years means a long time. If we spent a long time in the areas of our lives which were sometimes dry, which were sometimes people who were indifferent, where sometimes we complained because of the type of substance we were given. And still yet, God moved us out of that predicament, Egypt, the wilderness, to promised land. If God is moving us strategically through those patterns of our lives, God has already set up a position for us in our lives so that we are awarded blessings beyond our wildest imagination so that God just keeps strengthening us, encouraging us, and helping us to see that we indeed are the people of God. I just love the way Moses puts this. And so, yeah, I want to be like the individuals here. I want to be ready to go when leadership says go. I want to be able to do what I'm told to do. And if you are faithful to God, and if God has opened up avenues for you, when you hear the voice of God say go, go. When you hear the voice of God speak to you, then do what he says do. In verse 17, the word says, that just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Imagine the people saying this to Joshua. They are reassuring Joshua you may not be Moses. You may not be the great lawgiver. We may not be as impressed with you as we were with Moses. But since God is speaking through you, to you, and your task is to lead us, we're going to follow you just like we followed Moses. And so I say to you, my viewing audience, if you are in contact with God and God is speaking to you, be faithful to follow God's uh, leadership and his mandates. And if you believe that the man or the woman of God is leading you, follow the directives of the person that's been in charge of your spiritual well-being. In verse 18, the word says, whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. They're saying, we're going to follow you. As long as you follow Yahweh, and we're going to be obedient, but if there are individuals who are disobedient, if there are individuals who will not follow, then it is death to those individuals because they fail to follow the mandates of God. Let's learn to be faithful and to follow the mandates of God and watch God work. Not just in your individual life, but in the life of your family. Not just in the individual and in the family, but in the life of the church in the life of the temple, in the life of the synagogue, in the life of the mosque. And so we move to chapter 2. 
we've just discovered uh, that the individuals are moving towards the promised land. But always, before we get to the promised land, there are challenges that we face. Herein, Joshua is about to meet up with Rahab. One of the things that we usually wrestle with, uh, with how do you justify Rahab lying and then being blessed after she lies? Let's take a look at chapter 2 and see what happens. Verse 1 says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shotim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. Now Jericho was not one of those lands that the Israelites uh, embellished going through. It was a land that was believed to be filled with marauders and individuals who were just uh, trying to get whatever they could get out of other individuals. So Joshua sent spies out to see what's the land really like. You, all, you never send one person out at a time. You always send two but so that one can have the other's back. It's the same way in the life of the church. Even when you think about New Testament, and Jesus admonished the individuals, when you send them out, send them out two by two. So that if, in fact, one individual is not believable, the other individual can at least pick up and give credence to what the person is saying. And again, so that each individual has the other person's back. Listen carefully. He goes on to say, um, And they went and came into the house of a prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. So these two individuals sent out as a reconnaissance to make sure that the land was a land uh, that was appeasing for the people of God. The place that they found the stay just happened to be with a prostitute by the name of Rahab. The word says, And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, Men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Obviously, the king of, the, of Jericho was not someone who was so keen to the ideology that these Israelites would come into the city spying out what was going on. Verse 3 says, Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. So the king has suggested that he wants to know what these individuals are up to. So he sends his boys out to talk to Rahab. In verse 4, the word says, But, the holy conjunction, but, helps you to move away from what was just said and now focus on what's about to be said. For the word says, but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So there's something in this fourth verse that would suggest that this woman has done something to bless the people of God in spite of what the king, the local king, has desires for. The word says, And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. Now, obviously, Rahab uh, knows where they're from because they have informed her, but, they, but she's attempting to say what she says in order to keep them safe. It is a protective mechanism to keep the people of God safe because they are on mission for Yahweh. Verse 5 says, and when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. And you know right away, as we say, this is one of those terminological inexactitudes. This, this is a phrase, this is a term that's used that's not exactly the truth because she knows exactly where they've gone because she has suggested where they should go. In verse 6, the word says, But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid uh, in order on the roof. So again, she knows exactly where they are because she has taken the flax, put it over 
of the individuals to hide them strategically away from the king of Jericho. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. God has this uncanny way of protecting his people when he has given them an assignment and they've been faithful and just to that assignment. These individuals have been assigned to go out, spy out the land, and to find out what they can find out so that they can come back and tell Joshua exactly what they see. Verse 8 says, Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. And so the sister is quite aware that there is something special about these two individuals. She recognizes the assignment and the task that's been laid before them. And so as a result, she wants to make sure that they can complete their task. It would be so awesome to think that in the life of the church, there are individuals who would be willing, literally, to make sure that the success of the church and leadership is carried out according to God's mandate and his plans because they recognize the work of God. In order to recognize the work of God, you've got to be in his word. You've got to be close to him. You've got to spend face-to-face -to -face time to him. You've got to meditate so that you can hear his voice. And you've got to study his word day and night so that you know what his will and his way is for your life. And not only just your life, but for the lives of individuals around you. I contend that we don't spend nearly enough time in the word of God to know God's plan for us. Yeah, we may show up on Sunday, listen uh, to the woman or the man of God preach the word. We may listen to the pastor or share with us. We may show up at a Bible study from time to time. Uh, but so often, in our own time, we won't spend the time that's necessary to stay in that Word so that we are built up uh, on every side in our personal lives. Every religious institution ought to have time set aside during the week when there are Bible studies, when there are prayer prayer times for membership, you know, like here at the Second Baptist Worship Center on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., we will have a prayer time for the leadership of the church. And that's just designated uh, for the leadership. So leaders get together uh, on a line uh, to pray together, to ask God's blessings upon uh, the local body of Christ, the church, its leadership, and for our community. Then on Thursday nights at 7 p.m., uh, well, as well as the leadership and the entire congregation can come together at prayer time to specifically talk to God, to petition God on behalf of every member, every person in the community, leadership, caregivers, uh, our nation, the world at large. Uh, also, on uh, Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., we have the, the hour of power so that individuals can come out, adults, uh, and any individual who wants to learn more about the God, the, the Word of God, at 9 o'clock, get together here at the church so that they discover more about the Word of God and how we ought to live our lives. It's one thing to know the Word of God. It's another thing for us to know how to implement it in our lives. How are you living? You may study the Word, but really, how are you living? How are you behaving yourself? Are you, are you walking a holy walk? Are you talking like you should be talking? Uh, again, uh, get in those Bible classes. Uh, get in those sessions where you can pray. Make sure that you meditate upon God's Word. Make sure that you pray so that you can petition God on your behalf as well as the behalf of others. Verse 10 says, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites 
who were beyond the Jordan to Zion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And so the sister is just recalling those things that she's heard about what the God of the Israelites has done for the people of God. How God had brought them out of their Egyptian experience. How when they were captives and slaves and God delivered them from Pharaoh when Pharaoh refused to let them go. How Moses, the great lawgiver, had taken the law and presented it and then had petitioned Pharaoh to let the people go and then how God, through Moses, had indeed left evidence that God was in control and in charge and how Moses had led the people out of Egypt into the wilderness. This sister has heard the reputations of what God can do and what God will do for the people of God. She had heard how not only uh, he had delivered them from Egyptian bondage into the wilderness, but now she recognizes firsthand that it is Yahweh who is moving them strategically into a land of promise. Remember, Joshua means Jehovah saves. In the midst of the dilemmas, in, in light of every situation that Israel has been through, even though when they've been up against and outnumbered uh, when it comes to their enemies, God has still delivered them. Even when they didn't see how they were going to be fed, then God fed them from manna on high, gave them indeed food uh, that they were to eat in the midst of no. God gave them water when the land was dry from a rock. That's what God can do. And that's what God does for us every single day. We wake up each and every morning, not because we've been so faithful or so righteous, but rather because God has been kind and patient with us. And I declare to you this day that God is willing to bless you just as he blessed Israel when we look at the Old Testament. Verse 11 says, And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And so you discover that the heart of those who would be callous and indifferent have been made fearful because they recognize the evidence of God in the lives of the people who are following God. And so people can be intimidated and fearful when they recognize that God is working in you and through you. This sister even though she was a prostitute, even though she was someone uh, that the people didn't look so favorably at, God uses her. In spite of all the fallacies in our personal lives, God uses us. As messed up as we are, with our reputations as marred as they may be, God still uses us. You know what you were like, better yet. You know what you are now. Excuse me. Better yet, I know what I was. I know what I am. And God still loves me. In verse 12, the word says, Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I've dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sign, a sure sign, that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And so Rahab wants to make sure that since in fact you say you will bless me, please, whatever you do, since I've been a blessing to you, bless not only me, but please remember my father's entire household. Remember my brothers and sisters and bless them as well. Did you hear what was just said in that text? She's wanting to make sure that because God has blessed her and is willing to bless her, she wants to make sure that everyone that she knows is blessed as well. Her family, her father, her mother, uh, her siblings, she wants to make sure that they're blessed. If you and I are blessed by God, our whole ideology should be that we want other people to be equally blessed. If God has showered down blessings upon my personal life, I want, I desire of God to bless other individuals. My mom and dad have gone to glory now. 
but my, my sisters and brothers and all those that I know, my joy would be in knowing that they've been saved, that they've been blessed, and that God is continuing to meet their needs immensely. Verse 14 says, And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. That's the agreement that these two guys are making with Rahab. Since you have blessed us, since you've shown us kindness, and you've protected us from the king, it's our lives for your lives. No problem. This we will agree with. And he says, if you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Rahab, here's the words of these brothers. Since you have been so kind to us, if you don't share any of this with the king of Jericho and his followers, if we are able to escape unharmed, to get back to the people of God, then we're going to make sure that when we do come to possess this land that God has prepared for us, we're going to bless you. Do you hear that? Jehovah saves. He is saving individuals that many of us perceive are not worthy of being saved. Wow. So be careful how you look at other people. Be careful how you gauge them. Please know this, that just because they are not where you are does not mean they are unsavable. You, at one time, were an individual steeped in sin, caught up in your Egypt, deserted in your wilderness, and then God blessed you to be headed towards the promised land. In verse 15, Joshua says, Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. Now please recognize that it is a safe place to be housed in a wall. For anyone that is coming to you, whether it is enemy or friend, you see them before they arrive. It is indeed a safe place to live in the city wall. She was able to see them before they arrived. And when she received them, she received a blessing. And she said to them, go into the hills or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. You hear that? Not only is she helping them to escape, she's given them a formatted plan for how they can be saved and move on. Stay here for three days until the pursuers have moved past you so that then you are ready to move to the next stage. We've got to know when we can hold up so that we know when the time is right to move forward. The word says, then afterward, you may go your way. Verse 17 says, the men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you've made with us swear. So you know, as well as I do, the agreement has been made. No harm is to come to Rahab, nor her family because she has protected them in their hour of need. How many people have you protected in their hour of need? How many people have you been patient enough with, kind enough with, to see that because you've been blessed, you can be ultimately a blessing to someone else? I dare you. I challenge you today, as you've been blessed, to be a blessing to somebody else. Verse 18. Behold, when we come into the land, listen to the boys, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's 
household very clear very concise the boys are given directives now to Rahab tie the cord extend it from the windows so that when we return that cord is a symbol of salvation for you and your household gather everyone in your household so that salvation comes to your house wow Jehovah does save. He's saving Rahab, her mama, her daddy, her brothers, and the rest of the family. And in verse 19, the word says, Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. So as long as they stay, into the house that's designated with the cord, they are safe. But the moment they step out, they are on their own, and we are no longer responsible for them. Come here for a moment. Because the moment you are in the household of faith, as long as you stay within the perimeters of God, you are safe. But the moment you step away from, you'll discover that you are on your own. Whatever you do, stay in close proximity to where God resides. Whether it is in your home, in your workplace, in your church, wherever you are, make sure that God has residence in the place where you are. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. So anyone who indeed is in the house, if any harm comes to them, then we are responsible for the harm that comes to them. So if in fact an individual is a part of the household of faith and they are faithful to God, please know that they are shielded, they are protected by God. Verse 20 says, but if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. So the only thing the boys are asking, that as long as you keep the agreement that you've made with us, we're good. We're going to keep our side. You keep your side, Rahab. In verse 21, the word says, and she said, according to your words, so be it. So the bottom line, she says, amen. Because remember, the word amen means, so be it. In verse 21, she said, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. She wasted no time. She put the cord in the window, which symbolized salvation for everyone who was within is there cord hanging within the place where you receive God? Verse 22, they departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned and the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. When God has laid out a plan for you, when you follow that plan that God has laid out, you can rest assured that salvation is yours. In verse 24, the word says, And they said to Joshua, Truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands. That's the report that the boys have brought back to Joshua. Everything that we've seen, everything that God has promised, is true. The land is here. It's waiting for us. We've been blessed. And also, all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. The people who are there in the land are fearful. Their hearts melt away because they recognize the awesome presence and power of the God who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, out of the wilderness, and into the land of promise. That's a good way 
to start the book of Joshua as it opens to help us to understand the new leadership is prepared to lead the people of God into a land of promise. We, indeed, must be willing to follow when leadership is following the mandates of God. I'm so grateful this morning that you have joined us in our Bible study. It's our prayer uh, that you've been blessed as we have read together uh, the Word of God. And it's our prayer that you'll continue to delve into God's Word, to listen for the Spirit so that the Spirit reveals to you the truths that are hidden in His Word. Again, we remind you that you indeed can be a part of our prayer on Wednesday nights and Thursday nights at 7 p.m. You can be a part of our prayer on Sunday mornings at 11.30 to 12 o'clock on our prayer time here at the Second Baptist Church. You can be a part of our Bible studies here, obviously, on Wednesdays at 11, as well as on Sunday morning, the hour of, of power at 9 a.m. on Sundays. Please remember that we got a special day coming up, uh, September the 12th, and it's here at the Second Baptist Church. We invite all of you to be a part of the celebration of this pastor here at the Second Baptist Church. I've been here now for 28 years, and so we trust that you'll be a participant and a part of it. If you can't be here, bless us uh, with a precious gift uh, that we will be eternally grateful for. You'll find the ways and avenues uh, to ship that into us. You can call the church. Uh, we've got mobile accept. Also, uh, we've got cash app. But any way you want to be a blessing to us, this pastor will be eternally grateful. Again, thank you so much. See you next week with chapters 2 and 4 in the book of Joshua. God bless you and have a smile upon you. This is our prayer.